So let's read this text together. If you didn't bring a Bible, there should be one right there in front of you. We'd love for you to follow along. Mark 7, verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Verse 5. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachers, their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. So we're taking a few weeks to think about what it means to have a more vibrant walk with Jesus Christ, to know what that means on a daily basis. This is really our theme for the remainder of the year all the way up until September. It's part of our vision, Belong 2025, for each of us individually to have this life-giving, vibrant walk with, with Christ on a daily basis. And specifically, over these few weeks, we're thinking about what does that look like uh, from the Scripture, and we'll take a look at that again today. There's a statement that I want to bring to you, that I want to give to you, that I think defines what vibrancy really is all about, and it comes from this text, and it will serve as our outline as well. And here's the phrase, it's to resist at all costs the spirit of a Pharisee, which loves to prioritize man-made religious rules that make you appear to be more righteous than you really are, all the while neglecting the all-essential, life-giving Word of God. So I want us to say that together, and we're going to take it in four different segments, and those will be the four things that we'll look at this morning. The first one is, resist at all cost the spirit of a Pharisee. Would you repeat that after me, or with me? Resist at all cost the spirit of a Pharisee. And then the second part of this statement, let me read it and then we'll read it, uh, we'll recite it together, which loves to prioritize man-made religious rules. Let's say that together. Which loves to prioritize man-made religious rules. Then the third part of this text, that make you appear to be more righteous than you really are. Let's say that together. That make you appear to be more righteous than you really are. And then finally, all the while neglecting the all-essential life-giving Word of God. Let's say that. All the while neglecting the all-essential life-giving Word of God. It's amazing how we take the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and we reduce it down to the spirit of Pharisaism. And we're going to take a look a little bit about what that even means But I want us to think about, just first of all, what we've received as the good news of Jesus Christ and what that even means. There is a movie that was made back in 2013 called Captain Phillips. It's a true story of a container ship that was hijacked by Somali pirates. Captain Phillips was taken hostage And then Navy SEALs converged on this little makeshift boat, and they made this dramatic rescue 
And uh, there was a lot of blood that was spilled in the process, but then Captain Phillips was rescued in a very, very dramatic way. True story. And I want us just to capture the thought and the idea of rescue because I think it, it contrasts the spirit of being a Pharisee. How we can reduce this amazing news of rescue and then somehow... It, it becomes a religious set of rules that we follow. Nothing about what the gospel is really all about. So take a look at this scene, if you would. It's just immediately after Captain Phillips gets rescued. Let's look at this together. Story about a great rescue. That's our life. If we can get the house lights back up, well, it'd be great. It's, a, uh, you know, it's, a, it's just a picture of how you've been rescued if you put your faith in Christ and what he's done for us. And this is what angered Jesus so much, is that the very reason he came was to bring rescue, to give us life. And we've been set free. And then these Pharisees come with these religious rules and say, this is what life is really about. If you'll do this and this and this, and it became all about rituals, and it was nothing about the freedom that Christ came to give us. Imagine this rescue, and then this guy gets off the boat, and he goes right back into some lifestyle, back where he is with his enemy. He was just saved from that. That was Paul's message in Galatians chapter 5. He said it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Jesus said, there's a better yoke. If you're burdened by all of these rules and these ritual, rituals that these Pharisees keep loading on your shoulders, he said, take my yoke upon you. It's completely different. Take my yoke upon you. I'm gentle and humble in heart, he said. And you'll find true rest for your souls. So if we're going to learn how to live in this freedom and enjoy this vibrancy that God has for us, it begins by resisting at all cost the spirit of a Pharisee. And it's in us. There's a, there's a little bit of this in all of us. It's in me. And we need to resist it at all cost. This is who these Pharisees were. They were Bible-believing, holy-living, rule-following Jews who desperately tried to earn God's favor. They were Bible-believing. They believed the Bible. Their doctrine was great. They believed in the Old Testament. They were holy living, super uh, zealous to keep the law of God, rule-following. They stacked up rule upon rule so that they could follow God even better. And they were working desperately to earn God's favor. In Luke chapter 15, we see Jesus tell three different stories. Um, the last one being that there was a, a, a prodigal son who walked away and came back. And you, you're familiar with that story. But the older brother is a representation of the Jews. And so when they're celebrating and having this great party because the prodigal son had returned, the older brother, this, the scripture says in Luke 15, was out in the field. He was doing his job. He was doing the right thing. He was doing everything correctly, everything that the father would want. And he comes back in close to the house and he hears all of this celebration going on. And he gets, into, he gets into a conversation with one of the servants and says, we're all celebrating. Your brother's come home. And he doesn't go into the party. And the father goes out to him and he pleads with him to come in. And he's so upset. And he says, all of these years, I've been slaving for you, following your orders. And now your prodigal son comes home and you give him a party. The spirit of a Pharisee who does it all right, but is so distant from what it means to have a vibrant relationship with the Father. We resist at all costs the spirit of a Pharisee. We see it in these first two verses 
Mark 7, verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem, they gathered around Jesus. So they had been sent from Jerusalem to this location in Galilee, which is probably around 100 miles. I mean, these guys were angry at Jesus and what he was teaching. Jesus was teaching something completely different. We saw that in Mark chapter 1. The people were amazed. They were like, who is this, te- who is this teacher and what is this teaching? It's got new authority. It's not just like man-made rules. It was different. And so they come from Jerusalem and they, they are ready for a fight and ready for an argument. They're looking for ways that they can trap Jesus. It says in verse 2, they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. Nothing about hygiene here. This is all about the ceremonial ritual washings that the Pharisees required. And Jesus would have none of, none of it, nothing to do with it. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Apostle Paul gives Timothy a, uh, s- some words to say, watch out for these kinds of people. Resist this at all cost. Look at these scriptures with me, and, and it's just one verse, but in a variety of different translations. Let's just look at these for a moment. 2 Timothy 3, 5. These are people who have a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people in the NIV. Or they will maintain a facade of religion, but their conduct will deny its validity. You must keep clear of people like this. Or here's another. They will appear to have a godly life, but they will not let its power change them. Stay away from such people. Here's another. They will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. Don't be taken in by people like that. And then finally, they will act as if they were serving God. But what they do will show that they have turned their backs on God's power, have nothing to do with these people. So we resist at all costs the spirit of a Pharisee. And then we move to the next section of our text here, and that is which loves to prioritize man-made religious rules. Resist at all costs the spirit of a Pharisee, which loves to prioritize man-made religious rules. We see this in verses 3 through 5. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? This word tradition, or tradition of the elders, or tradition of men, it actually occurs six different times in this text. In verse 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, and 13. So this is the big emphasis that Jesus is making here that mark our writer is saying there's also this phrase rules taught by men in verse 7 so this is what the pharisees are all about it's prioritizing man-made religious rules these are oral traditions that actually have nothing to do with god's true requirements so there's god's law there's the mosaic law and then there are oral traditions that they piled on top of that for the the people to follow and what they required. And what does this look like? Dr. Ralph uh, Wilson, he writes this. He says that um, since the Pharisees were passionate in their desire to obey God's law, they developed over time an oral tradition known as the tradition of the elders. And so what they did was they built a hedge or a fence around biblical commandments. The idea was that obedience to the tradition of the elders formed a barrier that would prevent a pious Jew from breaking a biblical commandment itself. So, you've got the commandment. And then the oral tradition said, we better build a fence around that commandment. And so, they built a a wider fence so that people would not get close to breaking that commandment. But then they didn't stop there. They would build another fence, and another fence, and another fence, And before you know it, it was all about the fences and not about 
the command of God. And so he goes on to give uh, several examples of this. So in the Mosaic Law, it said we, they were to refrain from work on the Sabbath, Exodus chapter 20. And then the tradition of the elders would say harvesting is work. Plucking a handful of grain is harvesting. Jesus' disciples were guilty of breaking the Sabbath by eating some grain plucked in the fields as they passed through. Healing was equated with work. And so therefore, Jesus, they were saying, could not heal on the Sabbath. All of these fences that went around the command. Or here's another example. Fasting on special occasions would be a sign of repentance. But it says in Luke chapter 18 that they would fast twice a week. That was their fence. So, you know, if it's, if it's good for you to exercise and be on the treadmill for 20 minutes, they would say, well, it's even better for 30 minutes. And, and you ought to turn up the speed a little bit more because that's even going to be better. That's the tradition of the elders. So this doesn't probably mean a lot for us unless we get super practical. And what does this mean for our day? How do we turn this amazing good news into something that it's not. And what it actually does is drive people away from the God that we want them to know. In fact, the irony here was the more righteous these people looked to others, the more rejected they were by God. The more righteous they looked in front of others, the more rejected they were by God. What does this look like for us today? So, I asked uh, some friends to give me some of their thoughts about this. What are some fences and rules that take the place of God's Word? Um, I asked them to just give me their thoughts, their first response, just like in a quick three minutes. Tell me uh, what it is that you think of when we think about these fences that we put up. So if you don't like some of these things that I'm going to read, um, don't get upset with me. These are some of my friends, what they told me, just so you know. Some of them are fences, some of them are attitudes that we can get in the church because of this spirit of a Pharisee. Let me just read them for you. What does it look like today? Requiring prayer before a meal. Like if you don't, that's somehow sinful. That um, we require a daily quiet time, which is a funny word, quiet time. But that's required somehow if you're not doing a daily quiet time of some kind. That that would be sinful. Ritually praying the words in Jesus' name as some kind of magical formula. Making a certain Bible translation the only translation or the only option. Wearing a hat while praying or worship, worshiping. Piously holding to political views or candidates or parties while losing a love for people. Clinging to certain worship styles as more spiritual than others. Being critical of those with tattoos or piercings. Judging people based on their media choices. Allowing church to become a bubble of homogeneity in which those whom we judge as different don't feel welcome to even attend. Teaching people that a prayer will save them. Not modeling and practicing confession, transparency, and vulnerability. Living lives that pro profess, I have it all together, as opposed to I desperately need Jesus. Long-winded, elaborate prayers with language few people can understand or relate to. Demanding adherence and literal interpretation of Scripture in some areas while allowing for liberal interpretation or ignoring Scripture in other areas, all to suit our personal agenda. Evangelizing, baptizing, teaching, but to the exclusion of relationship and discipleship. Spending 90% or even 100% of our time and effort on believing Christians who already attend church and next to no time with the unchurched. Being unwilling to cooperate or collaborate with ministries who are of other denominations, different denominations because of their approach or philosophy, including parachurch ministries. And finally, abusing spiritual authority in the name of Jesus. 
Man-made rules from the spirit of a Pharisee. When I was a kid, one of the things that attracted me to Christ was not in the church. I attended going to church, and I sat, and I listened, but I just didn't get it. And then I went to a, a fellowship, a Christian athlete camp, and all of a sudden it was a culture that I related to, and it was the same message, different environment. And all of a sudden it was like, this is something that I can relate to. And then I would go to Young Life meetings, a high school organization that reached kids kind of on their turf. And all of a sudden it was like, wow, I, I'm starting to understand this is different. Same message, different environment. These people seem to like me and love me and want me. Completely different. Resist at all costs the spirit of a Pharisee, which loves to prioritize man-made religious rules. Thirdly, that make you appear to be more righteous than you really are. These were people who were honoring God with their lips, but their heart was cold. It was just empty worship. We see this in verses 6 and 7. Let's take a look at that again. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it was written, and this is a quote from Isaiah chapter 29. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And so this was the way that they, they lived their life. Marshall Seagal uh, writes it this way. Here was the problem, as he defines it. They had developed ways of appearing to be godly without really preferring and prioritizing God in their hearts. What they knew about God was disconnected Okay, get this, what they knew about God was disconnected from how they felt about God and therefore left them even further from God. What they knew about God didn't connect to how they felt about God, which lets, left them being distanced further from God. So how do we fight this? If we're talking about vibrancy and that we want this kind of life and we want it to be real and not just about, okay, here's another thing that I'm supposed to do, and it's obligatory, and it's just another discipline, how does it become real and more life-giving for me? What does this kind of worship look like when it is from the heart, when it is genuine and sincere in my life? Let me just give you three thoughts about that. The first one would be to look back, to see what God has done for you. It's to see, I've been rescued. Like, that makes all of the difference. I will never lose sight of the fact that God has been merciful to me that I was captive by an enemy, I've been set free, and this changes everything. To look back, the scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, looking back on God's mercy, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true in proper worship. It's looking back and seeing what God has done for you. I read Several years ago in Dallas, uh, there was a 25-year-old young man. His name was uh, Hayden Carlo. He got pulled over by a police officer for uh, expired registration on his tags. And he told the officer, basically he said, it was either buy tags or buy food for my kids. And I didn't have enough money to do both, and so I got the food. And the police officer uh, ended up giving him a citation. But when the young man opened the ticket, unfolded it, there was a crisp $100 bill inside. And he said he just broke down. And his phrase was, what else can you do? I mean, that's mercy. So this is what God has, has done. We're guilty as charged. And it's not just like a little citation. We've rebelled against God. We've been far away from God. And he came and he loved us and he expressed this love on the cross and he set us free. And so we look back and we say, God, not just at the time that you died for me, but every day his mercies are new. And I'm always looking back and saying, God, thank you. Like I don't deserve this, but I'm free and I'm holy in your sight because of Christ. The second phrase that might help us just to have vibrancy is to look up, to look up. And by that, I mean that there are different responses as we begin to look at who God is. One would be uh, this idea of brokenness. 
that Isaiah chapter 6, when he worships, he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And he sees the train of of his robe in the temple. And he sees God for who he is. And in verse 5 of Isaiah 6, he says, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. So part of worship is brokenness. It's lament. It's saying, God, I'm so sorry for my sin. And when we also look up, we see another side, and it's on the other side of the spectrum, is that it's, it's celebration. So there's confession on one end, and there's celebration on another. And both are super important. When we look up at God, we say, God, you are so awesome, and we worship this way. I just got back from a retreat in Estes Park with about 20 other pastors, and we spent um, like uh, just a lot of time worshiping and praying and seeking the Lord together. And it's just so refreshing to see other guys who are so sold out for God. There's just a celebration, celebration. I experienced it this morning right here. Did you? Did you? We were singing about it, about this freedom. We're free. We celebrate. It's like David when they brought the ark back in to Jerusalem. And what did he do? He was dancing. And he was accused of how he was dancing. And he said, look, I'd be more undignified than this to celebrate before my God. Is that us? Is that you? Is it me? When I come on Sunday morning and we start worshiping, is it like, nah, nah, I'm just not, I'm really, really not into it today. Andrew, you know, if you'd just be a little more exciting up here, maybe something would happen. Serious. Do you worship with this kind of like, I'm all in? This is my life, and is it daily? This is not just about Sunday, but it's daily, God. And you can come and say, God, I'm not feeling it this morning. That's where I am at times. Would you help me? And as I get into your word, would you help me see you? Is it real as we look up? So we look back at his mercy. We look up at who he truly is. And then we look around. And I think this is so important because worship is not about an event. It's about our life. And so we look around. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether you eat or drink, do all to his glory. Really? Whether you eat or drink, do everything for his glory. Everything. It's a lifestyle. Or uh, Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you go to work on Monday morning and it's like, God, I'm offering myself. I'm going to give my very best here, but it's really as unto you. It's an attitude of worship. And listen, it's not just about religious things. It's about caring for the needs of others. In Isaiah chapter 58, sometimes we think of worship service as in this. But the Jews in the Old Testament were fasting, and God was not impressed. And he says, is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen? Listen, when you fast, here's the kind of fast I really want. Loose the chains of injustice. Untie the cords of the yoke. Set the oppressed free. Break every yoke. Is not a true fast to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. This is worship. In view of God's mercy, I look back. I look up and say, God, this is who you are. Sometimes that breaks me. Sometimes it causes me to celebrate. And I look around me and I say, how can I worship God by serving and giving my life away? That's worship. That's vibrancy. And then the last part of this is all the while neglecting the all-essential life-giving Word of God. Let me just read these again. Resist at all costs the spirit of a Pharisee, which loves to prioritize man-made religious rules that make you appear to be more righteous than you really are, all the while neglecting the all-essential life-giving Word of God. And we'll just close by reading verse 8 of Mark 7. Jesus said, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. It had become about something very different than what this book is about. They were twisting God's word to accommodate the life they really wanted. We see it on three different times here in verse 8, 9, and 13. 
that they were exchanging God's word for something that was human, a man-made tradition of some kind. And so the example that Jesus gave was Corban. These guys were saying that, uh, you know, Moses said, take care of your parents, honor your father and mother. You should be providing for them and caring for them. And then they, they said as Pharisees, well, we've got this thing called Corban. It's an offering to God. It's been dedicated to God, so I can't take care of my parents. Jesus said, that's crazy. The rule that God's word says, take care of your family, a human tradition says, mm, that's just a separate offering. I, I got this for God. Sounds spiritual. Sounds good. Very far from what God was requiring. And we do this. He said you do this in a number of ways. That was just one example. So the purpose of the Bible, as we get into the word of God, I want you to think about this this week, and we'll close here. What is the purpose of this, of this book? What is it for? For many of you, the purpose in your mind is to be a better person. If I can be in this book, it's going to make me a better person, and surely God will be pleased with that. And I want to suggest to you, that's not the purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is to know God so that you can become who God wants you to be. It's not about, okay, I've got to read this so then I know everything that I'm supposed to do. It's different than that. There's a different perspective. If my purpose is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, if it's to know Christ, I will be a better person. But it won't be some kind of rules that I'm seeking to keep. Yes, God wants me to keep every single command in this book, which is a byproduct of knowing my God as he fills my life, and I begin to live for him. This was the central problem of the Pharisees. In John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, Jesus said to them, You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Purpose of the Scripture? To come to Jesus. He will change our life to be what it's supposed to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this incredible, incredible truth of who you are. Lord, we want to follow your word. We want to do everything in it. It's what you've given to us. It's right for correction, for rebuking, for training in righteousness, all of this. But Lord, we know That apart from the Spirit of God living inside of us, we can do none of this. And the greatest thing that we can do is to know you so that you can help us to do what's in this book. So Father, I pray that in this moment, if there's somebody here that has the appearance and the form of religion, in godliness, there's a form, but it's not real. I pray this would be their day to recognize that there was a rescue mission on their behalf. And it came through the cross. And somebody took all of our pain and shame, Christ upon himself, and he set us free. And if you'll embrace that today, he rose from the dead to, to step inside your life and to guide you and to help you to be what he wants you to be. If you'll embrace that truth, he'll give you life, vibrancy. But you've got to call out to him and say, yes, Lord, I want this. So Lord, thank you for this gift. Help us to live in freedom and to never go back to this bondage of slavery. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.